This chapter is going to cover the revenue cycle. So we've already talked a bit about some of the cycles inside of accounting, but this is probably the one that's going to be the most intuitively obvious to you as you walk through it. And that's just because you've probably seen some decent parts of this as a consumer. It will be different though. When you walk into Best Buy or walk into Starbucks and engage as a consumer, you're dealing with small amounts, you're dealing with credit cards, you get the items right away. So it's a fairly simple process. But when we scale it up and get to a larger environment where you're buying millions of dollars worth of parts over multiple year cycles, then you really have to break these pieces apart and be more careful and systematic about it. So this chapter of our AIS textbook is going to really dive into what does this process look like. We can kind of break it into four different pieces. We start with some sort of sales order. So we have to talk to someone, we have to agree upon what we want to actually purchase and under what terms. Then we have to ship them the goods, we have to bill them, and then eventually collect the cash. And one of the key aspects of this entire chapter is going to be how to control all of these things and understand what's happening at every single point. At each point along the process, that stuff is going to go wrong. And so we have to think about how we're going to track it and how we're going to respond to it. So let's look at the high-level view here. We have some kind of sales process. So we have someone come in and they want to buy something. So let's say, for example, we're selling a bunch of merchandise for a coffee shop. So we say we want to have our customer come in and make an order. In that order process, we have to decide what exactly they want and for how much. And so if you think about the actual artifact you have here, it's something called a sales offer and purchase order. Next thing we have shipping, which we deliver the coffee to our customer. Then we send them an invoice and eventually we get cash. And again, these key elements here, we'll see things like bill of lading, see things like invoices and remittances. And then all of these tie to some sort of data source as well. So if you look at the sales entry, sales offer, purchase orders element, we're gonna sort of track this under our orders table. Bill of lading is gonna impact our inventory. Invoices has to go to our receivables. And then finally, remittances are going to go with our cash. And so each of these have some kind of artifact. And they also tie to some sort of data in our system, our ERP system. So let's kind of walk through and see how this works. This is a, again, this looks kind of complicated. But if you walk through, it's actually fairly straightforward. Let's start at the top and work our way down. So first off, we're going to start with a buyer. A buyer comes in and asks if we can sell something to them. Now the answer could be no. It might be that we only have a different variety. They're looking for some kind of light coffee bean and we only have decaf coffee beans. It might be that we don't have the right amount. It might be that we don't have the right timing. I have some, but they need it three months from now. And so the first discussion has to be just, here's what we're trying to get. Next, we have our sales department say, OK, yes, we can, and we'll sell it to you for a certain price. Now, the prices vary a lot. It could be that we have a relationship with the buyer. We might give them volume discounts. And this also varies by the kind of industry that we're in. If you go to Starbucks, it's fairly standardized. Everything is written down. The cashier just basically pulls up the list and charges you the price. But you could be working as a customer for Boeing. And you might be a supplier giving Boeing um, some kind of seat cover. And Boeing might be your only customer. And so the relationship you have here can be very different than what you might think of when you just go to Starbucks and get something. Now, the key artifact we generate at this point is called the sales quote. So this is a formal document that we're going to want to keep a hold of. And we keep a hold of these because we use this to reconcile later on. Then from the buyer, they send us a document called the purchase order. The purchase order says, yes, we agree to your terms, and here's what we want, and here's our formal, basically, contract saying that we're going to get that item. We're going to sell it at that price. And we want to make sure that these things tie together. It's very possible that the sales quote might offer 100 units for $30, but the purchase order ends up saying 122 units. And so this is part of the reconciliation process and the controls process. You want to make sure that all these things tie together precisely. OK, so we get the purchase order. We're ready to send them the stuff. So Usually in the real world, what happens is the shipping department is going to take our, our uh, actual things we're selling them and ship it. Now, often we'll ship it through some other supplier. So say, for example, FedEx. Right? We pack it up. We pack up you know, 1,000 bags of coffee. We give it to FedEx, and FedEx delivers it to our buyer. 
we usually have some kind of documentation in that package. For example, a packing slip or might see a bill of lading. And again, that's so that when these things arrive at the buyer, they know what they actually are and what they tie to. So then we'll talk about this more from the other perspective, but basically the buyer is going to tie our packing slip or bill of lading into their purchase order and into the sales quote. Now, once this has been done, our AR, Account Retrievable Department, is going to ship a sales invoice, basically saying, we would like for you to pay for what we sent you. Now, this is sort of a separate step from the shipper. You might think, well, well why is that? Why don't we just put the sales invoice in with the stuff we're sending them? Well, it's because these items that we send are probably going to be delivered to a warehouse. They're not going to be delivered to the accounting department directly. And we also want to separate out these in separation of concerns. The idea is that they get a bunch of stuff with a bill of lading. The people in the warehouse don't need to know how much it costs for these items. That might be proprietary information. And so when we send the sales invoice, it goes to their accounts accounting department, and the accounting department has information that they need. Okay. What happens next? Well, next, the buyer, hopefully, actually sends us something. They're going to send us the remittance memo. Now, the remittance memo says, what does the check actually apply to? Now, it's going to send us a pile of cash. You think, okay, well, that seems complicated. Well, the buyer might have 10, 30, 40, 50 orders with us a month, and they want to pay us a check for a whole bunch of those at one time. And so we need to know how to tie them together. It's also possible that we give the buyer certain terms and conditions, saying if you pay us, say, you know, within five days, we'll give you a 1% discount on the total purchase price for this. So we need to know which of these discounts the buyer is actually taking advantage of, because we've got to take that remittance memo and take that check and actually tie it back together. When we take the check, we're probably also going to want to be careful about separating it out from the remittance memo. The idea is we want to separate out the different responsibilities. We'll talk about ARC when we get into controls later. But basically, we don't want the people who have the cash to also be responsible for inputting changes into our ERP system. We want to split those two pieces out. So what are some of the threats? Well, uh, inaccurate or invalid master data. So we're sending back and forth a lot of different documents. We want to make sure that all of these go to the right people. So for our buyer, we want to ship things to one location, and we want to ship the sales invoice to a different location. It might be a multinational corporation. It could be they centralize some things or not centralize some things. So we have to worry about all that kind of thing. We don't want to have things shipped to the wrong location. What would happen if the sales department was able to input information on the bill of lading? Well, they could say, hey, you know what? Send those diamonds to my house. They ship the diamonds to their house. They take out two and then send them on to the buyer. And the buyer then thinks, oh, wait, our company is not providing the diamonds that we should have. So we want to make sure that the sales department has limited control over what the shipping department sends to. We want to make sure we don't disclose sensitive information. It could be pricing, it could be delivery terms, it could be the fact we're selling them at all. We want to make sure data doesn't get lost or destroyed. Again, this is just sort of standard for all of these processes, but it's surprisingly easy to make mistakes and mess up our data. And then it's performance. How long does this process take and how much does it cost? So controls. Controls are some of the things we do to make sure these threats don't happen. So we'll have controls over our data processing. We're going to restrict access to the master data. We're going to review all changes to master data. And this is really important. And again, thinking back about the sales department, we don't want the sales department to be able to write a new shipping address on an existing customer. We want to make sure that that is controlled. Same thing for where to send the check. You know, maybe if this person over here on the check gets access to the remittance memo as well. Well, if they have access to both of those things, they can tweak the remittance memo and pocket some of the money. So we have to be really careful with all of changes. We're going to have a bunch of controls, things like encryption. We're going to track our customer data really carefully. We're going to back up things properly. And then, of course, we'll have reporting here. And as an example of some reporting, you might want to say, all right, if you're the sales department, What's the stage of each sale that we're making here? Is it in quoting stage? Is it in delivery? Are we waiting for the invoice? Have we been paid? And all this stuff managers want to know. They want to know how long does this whole process take from initial to very much on the end, because this affects our cash balance. If we've got a bunch of orders we haven't collected on, well, then that means we've got less money available for other projects. All right, so let's kind of look at some of these pieces and give you some, some real concrete examples. Sales order. All right, so sales order says we are going to give the, the buyer a quote. 
a quote says, we are offering to sell these items to you at this price. So what are some things that happen in this process? Well, you'll have something that looks like on the right, which is a sample uh, sales quote, sales order. We want to do things like check the customer credit. If they're a new customer, do we want to sell them a million dollars of diamonds? Or are we going to say, you know what, we'll do, we'll do $10,000 first. You can pay us, then we'll ship you another $10,000. We want to know how much are we allowed to basically loan them money until they pay us. We're going to make sure inventory is available. And this is actually a lot more complicated than you might think. What if you've got two people coming to us, each of them want to order a bunch of coffee, and we can only fulfill one of the orders? Well, who gets first dibs? Do you set these coffee beans aside for customer A and give a sales quote and then say, customer B, sorry, we're, we're out? Or do you say, hey, first come, first serve? Or maybe customer B is a better customer and we want to give them priority. So there's a lot of options that we have on the sales quotation that we have to check for inventory availability. And of course, just answering the customer inquiries. So what are some problems here? Well, incomplete or inaccurate orders, invalid orders, uncollectible accounts. You know, we sell to a customer we can't get cash from. Uh, stock out and excess inventory. We don't want to have a bunch of stuff sitting around in our warehouse just wasting our cash. Instead, you want to make sure that we keep the minimum amount of inventory that we need on hand, but enough to make sure we don't run out of stuff. We don't want to lose our customers. If we can't deliver the products and goods in a timely manner for the right price, we're going to go elsewhere. So what are some controls? Well, like our similar process, we have to have some data entry controls. Who gets to input that we have inventory? Who reconciles inventory accounts? Again, we want to restrict access to our master data to make sure it's accurate. We need some kind of authorization process for a sale. So this could be the sales manager sees all quotes before they go out and signs them. As an example here, imagine that you're a salesperson and you are being paid off of how many orders you make that cycle. Well, if someone comes to you and says, hey, I want to order 10,000 units, say, you know what, that's great. You're an awesome customer when really they're a pretty crummy customer because you're motivated to make that sale no matter what because you get paid if you make more sales. So you need to have some sort of checks on there to make sure that the salespeople don't go overboard. You want to check your credit limits. How much are you authorized to basically loan a customer in inventory until they pay you? We want to check our aging. How long is it taking to get paid on all these things? It might be you have a customer that's behind on payments and you say, hey, we're not going to ship you any more inventory until you pay us for the prior one. Then we have our inventory controls. How do you track your inventory? Are you using barcodes, RFIDs? Do you do physical counts? And then some kind of forecasting method. How do, you, how do you communicate to your suppliers an information so that they can deliver product so that you can then sell it to your customers? Okay, let's dive into the shipping process now. So this is an example of a packing slip. So a packing slip says we're going to pick these products off of the warehouse and put them in a truck and send it to our customer. Now, we want to think about our, our actual um, source documents here. You might have a packing slip. Packing slips are things like contents, right? What's actually inside of it. Uh, you might also think about some kind of bill of lading saying when will things actually change legal ownership? Do we change ownership when we send them to FedEx or when FedEx actually delivers them? And that's really important because that affects your inventory. If I ship something into a truck, do I reduce my inventory that day or do I wait a week until it's actually delivered to my customer? One of the things you'll notice on this packing slip is that there's no money on it. Instead, you're saying how much was actually ordered and how much is actually in this item right here. Typically, you also want to have some kind of order so that way the people who are receiving can tie this to the right sale. So what are some problems here? Picking the wrong items or quantity, uh, theft, or just shipping errors. And again, theft can be a pretty big issue with a lot of this valuable stuff out there. So you need to have controls to make sure that people aren't just take, taking stuff home with them. So what are some controls? Some controls are barcodes. Uh, you will look at reconciliation. For example, the pick list needs to reconcile the sales order. We want to make sure our physical access is limited. Only people who need it get into the warehouse. We're going to have documentation whenever inventory moves, and we're going to do physical counts of the inventory. 
And again, think about controls. You don't want the person who is doing picks to also be doing inventory counts. You want them to be separate jobs so that each person can check each other. And lastly, just reconciliation. We have all these different source documents, so we're going to always go back and make sure they match. Okay, billing. What does the billing and sales invoice actually look like? Well, again, we have our source document, which is the sales invoice. So as an example, we have this item on the right here. We have some items, we have price, quantity, discount, tax, all that kind of information. And so some of this stuff um, is something that you may not know up front, right? So you don't want people in the warehouse to worry about tax or discount information. They're just worried about the quantity and the, the items. We also want to make sure that as you bill, you update your AR or accounts receivable. So once we finish the sale, we're allowed to input it into our ledger and record an actual change. And so you'll take off the inventory, you'll record the revenue on the sale, and then the customer is expected to pay us within 10, 15, 30 days. In terms of other documents you might see, you might have mem credit memos. For say, for example, you ship the customer some goods and their spoilage by the time they are delivered. Where a customer might say, hey, you know, I ordered a bunch of coffee and these ones here are expired, I can't sell them. And so what you'll do sometimes is send them a memo saying, hey, don't bother returning them to us because they're garbage now. But we're going to give you a credit memo saying that, hey, we owe you $200 to replace the, the spoiled inventory. You might also need to have monthly statements. So you let the customer know how much they owe to you in total. And again, you might have tens of hundreds or thousands of sales with a customer, and you need to keep track of all these different sales. So what are the threats? I, maybe you'd forget to bill the customer. This is shockingly common. Uh, I've had multiple people who have uh, dealt with like home renovations that you'll have a contractor just literally forget to send them a bill for the services provided. And it might be six months, 10 months before you get the bill for something that someone did. Errors. Do they charge you the wrong amount? Do they risk the wrong item? Uh, with your AR account, maybe you posted incorrectly, you put the wrong customer on. Or you might have a credit memo that's inaccurate or invalid. So what are some controls here? Again, we're going to work on reconciliation. We want to make sure that our sales order matches the shipping, matches the billing. We also want to split out the shipping and billing. We don't want the same person to have control over both elements. Other controls might be data entry controls, uh, things like having price automatically input, making sure not everyone can input items, and again, reconciliation. We're also going to check our subsidiary accounts to the general. So basically, subsidiary accounts are broken out by customer. So rather than just saying, I'm going to debit or credit the AR account, I'm going to debit or credit AR customer one. AR, customer two, AR, customer three, and then I'm going to reconcile, I'm going to match those with the overall AR account. I also want to mail monthly statements to the customer, make sure that we catch any errors by letting them know what's on our books, and we're going to segregate out the authorization and recording function. In other words, if someone's authorized to give credit to a customer, we don't let them also record that as well. And again, we're doing ARC or separation of concerns. All right, lastly, the good stuff, we get cash. So when we get cash, often they will be sent this remittance advice source document. And the idea here is we need to know what does this check actually apply to? What individual sales are there and are they applying any credits to the balance? When this comes in, we're also gonna try and split them out. So the remittance advice is gonna be input into our accounting system and the payments are gonna be given to the bank. We don't want the same person to do both. We're gonna split those off. And the issue here we have is theft. If the same person gets to record and also have custody of the cash, then we're giving them possibility of pocketing some of that information. The other option off, uh, problem we have here is just cash flow problems. This is a, a long process between the original sales quote to the delivery of the item to billing to being paid. And so if this takes too long, our company is gonna run out of cash. And this is why you can have a company that makes money on revenue, but yet goes out of business because they can't collect the cash that they're owed. So what are some controls? Well, segregation, all right? When we open up envelopes from our customers, we're gonna have two people there. One person grabs the cash and deposits it. The other person grabs the remittance advice and updates our accounting system. 
But also have things like lockboxes where payments go directly to the, the bank. We don't even need to have them come to us or electronic transfers. We're going to use, use things uh, like endorsements. All right, we're going to stamp checks as soon as they come in. Um, we're going to use other things like discounts or early payment, cash flow budgeting. So again, like there are different ways to kind of deal with theft and with cash flow. But we want to speed up the collection, which we can do with a lockbox or digital transfer. We're going to give discounts for early payment. We're in a budget to see when cash comes and goes. All right, so this was a fairly high level view of the revenue cycle process. At the end of this, you should have a pretty good understanding of the major steps in the sales process or the revenue process. You should know what the source documents are and kind of have a basic idea of what comes on them. Now, unfortunately, every company is going to be a little bit different here. You'll find that the terms will vary by the industry and the exact workflow will be different based off of where you end up. But this gives you a high level kind of general process that is adapted to fit specific industries and specific problems. But hopefully that will give you a good base of knowledge for our class where we get more into the revenue cycle.